Well, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, colleagues. Um, from a very cold and wet England, uh, unfortunately, we're having some problems with the technology. So whilst you'll be able to hear me, you won't be able to see me, uh, which just goes to show that I didn't really need to iron that shirt before I came on today. Anyway, welcome to the eighth um, uh, World Cotton Research Conference webinar. Um, I'm delighted to welcome two uh, very prominent cotton researchers today to talk to us. Um, but before I do that, um, I would like us to just take some time um, to reflect uh, on the, uh, the health and the lives of those people that have lost their lives in the recent um, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, the time, uh, as all of you, I'm sure, have seen on the news, uh, things are not good around the world, especially in India, and many of our cotton researchers are, are based there. And, um, and many of you have either suffered yourselves or have lost um, relatives um, in the current pandemic. So um, please, let's just take a, a few seconds just to remember them um, and wish those that may be ill good health and hope that they uh, come back to be with us in the very near future. So let us um, now start um, uh, officially, but um, before I do that, can I just remind you that should you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box. Uh, don't put them in the chat box, put them in the Q&A box, uh, and we'll uh, attempt to answer all the questions uh, during the session. If we run out of time, um, we will um, address those questions afterwards. Um, may I just remind both our speakers that we are—we have to be very strict on time because um, uh, the interpreters are booked for a certain amount of time. So I will be keeping you to your 40 minutes um, and I'll give you a, a, um, a shout um, about five minutes before that so that you can make efforts to um, round up uh, your presentation. So I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Eric Hecke, who is a Paul Whitfield Horn Professor and Associate Vice President for Research at Texas Tech University. Uh, he holds a PhD and the Habilitation Adriage de Recherche. I hope I pronounced that, to Eric, in my best schoolboy French. Um, in textile engineering from the University of Haute Alsace, Mulhouse, uh, France. Uh, Dr. Eke authored 112 refereed journal publications, two books, nine book chapters, and more than 260 conference papers. And since he joined Texas Tech University, he has been principal investigator or co-principal investigator on more than 250 funded projects totaling three, uh, sorry, $35.6 million dollars of which 12.7 million has been accredited to him at Texas Tech University. These grants and contracts are from state and federal agencies and the cotton industry. Over many years, he has provided international leadership in research on the measurement of cotton fiber pro properties and, cont and contaminants, including the impacts of these on textile processing performance. He is currently focused on collaborative research with the cotton breeding and cotton biotechnology community to develop improved properties in cotton fibers. Today, Eric will be talking to us about the importance of non-HVI cotton fiber properties. Welcome, Eric. The virtual floor is now yours. Good morning. So I've put together this presentation with my two colleagues, uh, Abu Said and Chris Turner. They are working with me. Um, why is it that it's not moving? Ah. So uh, as, as you probably know, several non-HGI fiber properties are essential uh, to accurately predict young quality. A non-exhaustive list is elongation, fiber length distribution, and the complex fineness maturity. 
none of these things are currently uh, assessed by HVI. So we'll begin with strength and elongation. The contribution of fiber bundle elongation in the work of rupture, which means the quantity of energy you need to break something, it could be cotton, could be anything, uh, is absolutely critically important for processing performance. But currently with HVI, we have a lack of calibration standards, which means that even if the HVIs are able to measure elongation as, as it is not calibrated, Basically, it's useless because you cannot compare from lab to lab, at least in uh, the system that use international cotton calibration standards. Elongation is not uh, available. So just to summarize very, very briefly, when you take something, fibers, yarn, piece of metal, you clamp it, you pull, and at some point, this object that you have will elongate, reach the maximum elongation and break. It's what you see on this curve here. And what we call elongation is the amount of extension that this product has before it breaks. And what we call the work to break, which is the most important, it's the energy you need to break that piece of material, it is the area under this curve. Currently with the HVI, what we have is this, the load divided by the mass of the sample, what we call tenacity. But several years ago, we did a lot of work on uh, trying to see if we could find a way to uh, assess the quality of cotton by using, in addition to just tenacity, also elongation. So this, has, this work has been done with, with an instron. So on this uh, graph, what you have on the X axis is a tenacity measured with an HVI. And W on the Y axis is the energy to break measure with an instron of the, of the same sample. So Let's take uh, this red dot right here. Let's say that we have a base in terms of, of quality that is 24 centinewton vertex and 6% elongation. That's this red dot. And let's say you are a cotton breeder. And um, so you are uh, trying to improve strengths because it's the criteria for which you have premiums and discounts. So better is, is a strength better is your premium. So it's what the producers would look for. So let's say that you have a line that is at 28 centinewton vertex. Now 28 is much better than 24, but you, you're not measuring elongation, but it just happened that the elongation of this specific line is just 4%. Your work to break is 20% below your base. Then you have another line that is 24. You don't keep it because it's, it's the same that you control. It's a base. It just happened that for this line, the elongation is 8%. Now you have a work to break that is 30% above your base. So the current system promotes high strengths and doesn't talk about elongation. So this type of scenario happens quite frequently. We see more and more varieties that have good strengths, but poor elongation, which means that their work to break is low and therefore the fibers will break in processing, creating short fibers, short fibers, etc. So in fact, the current marketing system, the variety with a higher strengths and a lower elongation will receive a premium while its performance in spinning and weaving, all of the parameters being equal, would be lower. So the question naturally comes, can we calibrate HVI elongation? So we did that for now several years. And um, we first demonstrated 
uh, with several colleagues that are cotton breeder, that fiber elongation is something that is highly heritable, which means that genetically you can improve it through just traditional breeding methods, no, nothing fancy. Fiber elongation can be improved while simultaneously improving fiber strengths, which leads to significant improvement in work to break. So, as I told you, HVI testing provides a measure of fiber bundle elongation, not calibrated, therefore you cannot compare between different labs. So therefore we said, okay, as we couldn't find any elongation calibrations, okay, let's do our own. So we use the ICCS protocol and uh, I will pass on, 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 the, on the details, but uh, we bought a lot of cotton uh, from different modules, measured elongation with a reference met, uh, method like, uh, like the stellometer to make sure that we had a good difference between the bales produce card web, and then begin to test. So we did uh, two elongation cotton, one low, one high. We tested in my lab in three HVIs. We tested for a relatively long period of time. It was in 2019, from April to, uh, to August, with 10 comps per sample. Uh, we had all the maintenance uh, of the machine done before we, uh, began the experiment. And uh, we calibrated with a user software that allows you to calibrate on one point. It is a, a thing that is a little strange. The user software allow you to calibrate, but there is no calibration cotton. So, so what were the results? As you can see for the free HVIs, the red bars is a low elongation the blue bar is eye elongation, you know, it's, it's after calibration, it looks really good. If you look at the stability, it is excellent. You know, it's from day to day, you know, you have very, very little variation, very stable. If you look at the third HVI, same thing. So it's, it's you know, you have, HVI one, two, and three. One, two, three. You see, it's very, very stable from HVI to HVI and within an HVI. So for the free HVI, we have comparable elongation level. The CVs between testing days are very good for all HVI, even when we go only to two measurements per sample. I didn't show you the data, but they are basically similar. And very importantly, the calibration is extremely stable over a long period of time. Therefore, frequent calibration is not needed. So currently, uh, with the user software, we can calibrate just on one point. So uh, it's, it's what we do. We use high calibration uh, cotton to calibrate, and then we use the two cottons to check. Every day we have check to make sure that the machine is not drifting. If you do that, and it's you know, pretty easy to uh, uh, include that in your, uh, in your protocols, uh, quality control, you have extremely uh, good results, very, very stable results. So which means that now you solve one problem, you can calibrate your HVI, We've produced some calibration material, and I hope that you know other people will do the same. Uh, we've shared this material with two other labs uh, in the US, uh, in Raleigh and in New Orleans, and they got exactly the same results we got. It's very, very stable. So now we can uh, work with the cotton breeders to improve at the same time strength and elongation. And, and I will show you a little bit later why it is so important to improve tensile properties. The second parameter that is extremely important is fiber length and, and its uniformity. So you've all, all, all probably seen an HVI. You make a comb, then you brush the fibers, then the fibers are scanned. And from that, you have what we call a fibrogram. Currently, the two measurements 
that the AGI is making are towards the long fibers. On this graph, you have the lengths on the x-axis and the light attenuation on the y-axis. So the AGIs currently are looking only at these longer fibers. There is really nothing here that is uh, used. So our question was, okay, these measurements, you know, we have tons of data on that since many, many years. It's stable, it's, it's, it's good measurements, high quality measurements. It's what is used for cotton classification all over the world. But what about this? Can we, can we do something with this other part of the fibrogram? Why is it important? It is important because when you look at the relationship between upper half mean length and mean length, it's excellent, which means that upper half mean length and mean length are very, very highly correlated. Basically, you don't have information on distribution by using only those two parameters because they are so highly correlated. And it's not just a few samples, it's more than 3,000 commercial beds. So this large part of the fibrogram is ignored, but does it include information of interest? Obviously, you know, if you want to have the complete fiber length distribution, you can use the AFIS. Uh, the AFIS is an instrument uh, that will separate the fibers with, with a rotor. It's what you see here, it's the opener of the AFIS. Then the fibers go into an airflow and pass in front of a sensor. It's an excellent tool, very, very good machine. I use it since many, many years. The problem is the speed. It's not as fast as an HVI. Therefore, in its current uh, iteration, the APHIS cannot be used for cotton classification. But we demonstrated that the information provided by the APHIS, and especially the fiber length distribution, is excellent to improve the prediction of young quality. So it, there is no doubt that having information on fiber length distribution could improve prediction of young quality. Why is it important? It is important because if you can have a good uh, estimate of, of young quality, if you are a spinner, uh, you know the type of equipment you have in your meal, you know the type of customers you have, the type of quality they demand, it will allow you to buy a product that corresponds better to your need than if you don't have any information on distributions. So with the AFIS, basically the fibers are individualized, they pass in front of a sensor and the length of the signal is the length of the fiber. Obviously a cotton fiber is never straight. You know, it's always crimpy. So it kind of see a signal a little bit shorter than the true length. If you look at, in this example, three different bales that are, are based on HVI, exactly the same upper half mean length, 1.10. And you look at the length distribution by number with the AFIS, you see that the length distribution are drastically different. What we are looking for, you know, to make a good yarn is this red curve. You have a very prominent peak. It's exactly what we want. The green is kind of okay. The black is not because you have a lot of short fibers, but they have the same lengths. The HVI is basically telling you they are the same, but they are not. The red will process extremely well. The black will not. Then if you look at the relationship between the mean lengths from the HVI and the mean length from the AFIS on a large set of samples, it's more than 3,000, 3,214 commercial bells. You see that the relationship is not that good. So you have a global trend, but it is not the same information. So clear that 
the information provided by the two systems are different. One of the reasons is that, you know, uh, with the AFIS, you need to separate the fibers. You have a mechanical process to do that, that, that is aggressive. And therefore, you will break some fibers with the AFIS. So the question is, which one is best? Is it the AFIS or is it the HVI? We know that we need both instruments in the current system to predict very well yarn quality. Tensile properties, but also yarn CV, thin places, thick places, etc. We know that we need both. We know that the most important from the AFIS information is the length distribution. We know also that the AFIS is too slow to be implemented in uh, a classification scheme. Uh, let's take the example of the US. We have, depending on the year, between 12 and 20 million bales. You cannot run 10 to 20 million bales on the AFIS. It's practically not feasible. Could we substitute the fabrogram from the HVI to this AFIS fiber length distribution information? So among the, the distribution information, one that everybody talks about, it's short fiber content. Short fiber content definition is very simple is a percentage by weight of fibers half an inch in length or shorter, uh, or the percentage by number for the same length. So why is it important this short fiber? Because higher short fiber content results in higher loss at the cutting machine. High short fiber content results in yarn defect, more yarn defects, and obviously productivity loss. And more yarn defect results in more fabric defect. So it's, it's, it's something that you know, we want to know. And there is another question. Are the short fiber fibers native? Were they already present when the cotton was still on the plant? Or is it created by mechanical processing? Just an example here. We took uh, quite a few samples, look at their maturity uh, with the AFIS, and look at the short fiber content. And you have a clear relationship between the two. When the fibers are immature, you have a lot of short fibers, which would tend to demonstrate that immature fibers are weak fibers and that these weak fibers will tend to break during mechanical processing at the gene, but also uh, in the textile mill. If you are extremely patient, and I am not, so I've, I've asked one of my technicians to do that. <laughs> uh, you take a sample and you separate the fibers just in two groups. Fibers shorter than three quarters of an inch and fibers longer than three quarters of an inch. And then you break the fibers one by one. You really have to be patient. But if you do that, and we did that several times on a bunch of samples, you can see clearly that the fibers that are shorter are also weaker. You see the mode is at four centinewton for the shorter fibers, while the mode is at eight for the longer fibers. So these shorter fibers, they are immature and weak. If you are a little bit more uh, detailed and instead of doing just two groups, you do many more, you see the same thing. The shorter fibers are weaker than the longer fibers. So conclusion, a large fraction of the short fibers are broken, long, weak, immature fibers that are created by mechanical processing. It is possible to retrieve fiber length distribution information from the HVI fibrogram 
And we have currently a major research program ongoing to determine the feasibility of using HVI ferrogram rather than DHS in yarn prediction models. And the results we have so far uh, show that, yeah, it, it, it is possible. Another parameter that is important, it's fineness and maturity. So if you look at a cotton fiber uh, up close, you'll see that the cotton fiber is twisted. And this is the reason why cotton is such a good textile fiber. This twist increased frictions among the fibers. If the cotton fibers were you know, cylindrical and sleek, it would be extremely difficult to make yarn with it. Uh, but as they are not, you have this twist, it increases the friction forces and basically interlocks the fibers together to make the yarn. You see also that uh, here it's just a, a, a average material fibers. You, you have quite a bit of cellulose in it, but it's not full of cellulose. So let's look at this a little bit closer. If you take fibers extremely young when still on the plant, and you make a cross section and you look under the microscope, you will see something like that. You see the, the different fibers, but they are stuck together. You see that they are not individual. A little bit later, you begin to see individual fibers. You begin to see accumulation of cellulose in the fiber. See, the wall is, is, is larger. But you see also that you have some points where the fibers are still stuck together. It means that if you are unlucky, for example, and this can happen in some countries, let's say that you have a freeze that kills a plant and you have some balls at this stage. These fibers will travel together during textile processing. And when you make, so it will create defects in the yarn, obviously. Then if you make a fabric with it and dye the fabric, this fabric will have defects. It's what we call shiny nets. It is an accumulation of very, very mature fibers that don't take the dye because the dye has nothing to cling on, you know, because you have very little cellulose. And they stay together because they are stuck together. You know, if it was, if these fibers were just randomly distributed in the population of fibers, we'll have no problem of white spec. But as they are stuck together, they travel together. A little bit later, you see clearly an increase in cellulose deposition. And at 49 days, you know, you have big fibers that are not round, but roundish. It is still in the bowl, you know, after that the bowl will open, the fibers will dry and all this will collapse to give you, you know, the traditional cross-section shape of cotton fibers that's basically a bean shape. You see here, you have just a few fibers. This one is very mature. You see the wall is extremely thick, but this one is not. They are in the same sample. You know, it's just a few fibers and you can take any sample of any cotton. You will see that. So I was very interested in this type of things. And so I decided to do something that I will never do again. Uh, I got a lot of cotton, 104 different cotton from different regions, different countries. And we decided to use a reference method for maturity and fineness, which, which is cross-section. Basically, you take your sample, you cut slices, you look under the microscope, and you measure the perimeter of each fiber, and you measure the quantity of cellulose in each fiber. We did uh, about between eight and 16,000 cross sections per cotton and obtain this graph from that. 
That's the most expensive graph I've never ever done because to produce this graph, I spent $500,000. <laughs> Uh, but the results are, are kind of interesting. So it's a little bit complicated to, to read it. So I will, I will try to explain this uh, simply. On the x-axis, you have the maturity ratio, okay? Higher is the maturity, better it is. On the y-axis, you have the fineness in Minitex. It's basically a weight per kilometer. On this, I have different fiber diameters. And here I have the micron. So let's say that I am interested in the micron of four because it's a non discount range. There are many, many ways to obtain a micron of four. One is, let's say, let's take, take this black dot here. This cotton has a micron of four but it's very coarse fiber, 19 micron. It's big fibers. And this fiber is immature. It's exactly what you do not want, for example, when you select material in a breeding program. Then let's go down this line of micron of four, and we reach this other black dot. So now, you have a fiber, fiber diameter of 14. It's excellent. It's exactly what you want, fine fiber. And a maturity of one, which is perfect. So this is perfect. This, you absolutely don't want it. But both have a micronear of four. And the reason why you need to be extremely cautious when you use micronear especially for cotton breeders, because by definition, they use lines that are extremely different. I have absolutely no idea what the fiber diameter could be. Okay, so, but it reinforced the idea that we need maturity and fineness information. Having only micronair is not enough. Unfortunately, I don't have a solution for that yet. We are still working on it, trying to find a measurement of fineness and maturity that is fast enough to be uh, implemented on AGVIs. So if you look at a cotton plant, a cotton plant is a perennial plant, which means that you know, if the conditions are good, you know, it, will, it will keep growing and growing for several years. But all the flowers don't appear at the same time, which means that on a plant like this, the first balls here will appear when the growing conditions are the best. And the ones here at the top, where the growing conditions at the end of the season are, are far to be optimal. Just because of the way the cotton plant grow, you have a huge, variation in fiber properties on one single plant. An example of that, so let me remind you the fruiting branches. This is these branches, one, two, three, four, etc. So higher is the number, higher you are in the plant. And we did cross section, we took samples along the plant, did cross section and measure theta, which is a measurement of maturity. And you can see clearly that when you go up the plant, you have a big drop in maturity. It's exactly the reason why, you know, very, very long time ago, uh, probably before many of you were born, people were harvesting the cotton not in one pass, but several passes. Because the first harvest is of much higher quality than the second or third harvest. Today, we don't have the time to do that. So we harvest everything at once with a machine. So now you take the same fibers after uh, measuring uh, maturity and you look at their strengths. I just gave you uh, three fruiting branches here. 
the one at the bottom of the plant, six in the middle, 12 at the top. This is at 12 at the top. It's much, much weaker than the one at the bottom on one single plant. I mean, when I say weaker, it's weaker. It's like a 2.7, 2.8 gram to break these fibers, while you are twice that for the fibers that are produced in the middle of the plant or the bottom of the plant. So immature fibers are weak and they tend to break when submitted to mechanical stress. Majority has a major effect on the propensity to break of individual fibers. Therefore, mechanical processing will modify the fiber length distribution by breaking fibers. And the intensity of this change is dependent partly on the level of maturity. So now just a, a, an example. So we have all these measurements and, and obviously we want to predict, yeah, we are not measuring because it's fun. Often it's not. Uh, we want to be able to predict yarn quality to give you know, tools to the spinners. So in this case, we took 20 commercial bales and we did ring spinning and vortex spinning, both carded and combed yarns. So one of the ideas is that if cotton could be adapted to vortex spinning, is throughput would make it very competitive with rotor spinning. And vortex, you can have 100% automation. The problem of ring spinning is that it makes an excellent yarn, but it requires a lot of manpower. And manpower is expensive. So it could produce the vortex yarn competitive with ring spun yarn in some market segments, not, not, not for all segments, but such as you know, uh, the 30 English count, uh, which is a pre pr primary uh, target market for US cottons. But because of poor fiber length distribution compared to synthetic fibers, cotton is not the fiber of choice in this market. Very few people use cotton in vortex. And when they use cotton, it will be PMAS type cotton and it will be combed. So here just a, if you have never seen uh, this type of machine, uh, a ring spinning frame and a vortex uh, spinning frame. Currently, what is dominant in the world is ring spinning. If you just look at US and China, uh, just look at the line with ring spinning. In 84, in the US, we, have about, we had about 14 million spindles. Then it went down to 670, uh, went back a little bit, but very little. Why? At the same time in China, we went from 22 million spindles to 110 million at the top in 2010. So it's a huge quantity of ring spinning that can be produced in Asia. Uh, ring spinning is very, very popular because it looks good. You have exactly, if you want a dress shirt, you will do it in ring spinning because the look is right. Airjet, you see that it's, it's pretty recent. So you don't have that much, but it's, 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 it's beginning. It's beginning. And so is it a trend that will continue? We will see. But it's something we need to look at. If you take uh, a piece of yarn and look under the microscope, uh, you can compare vortex and ring spun yarn. You see that for the ring spun yarn, the fibers are very, they are parallel and, and twisted. Uh, you have a very, very nice structure. You also have this apparent twist in vortex, but you, you can see that the structure is not the same. And especially the fibers that are, are in the middle uh, they are not twisted much, which means that the vortex provide a yarn that is weaker than the ring spinning. In terms of look, it's, it's, it's good. You know, it, it looks pretty similar to ring, but the strength is much lower. So currently we are working on, on trying to determine what is uh, 
the order of the fiber properties. Which one is the most important? Is it strength? Is it length? Is it fineness? Is it cleanliness? We don't have the answer to that yet. For ring, length first, then strength, then fineness. So we did spin this uh, 20 yards, 20 bales. And an example here, you have the tenacity of the ring spun yarn on the X axis. This line here is the equality line, okay? And here you have the vortex. As you can see, all the data points are much below the equality line, which means that the vortex provides a yarn that is much weaker than ring spun yarn. So if we want to be competitive with a ring spun yarn in terms of tensile property, we'll have to increase drastically fiber strength, which is possible. You know, uh, in the US on average, we are um, um, about 30 grams per tax uh, for the cotton that is marketed here. But in breeding programs, it's not uncommon to see upland cotton with strengths of 35, 40, 45. I've even so 50 in some cases. So th there is still a lot of genetic variability that can be used to improve drastically strengths. And it's what we need to do if we want to go to the vortex. You can also comb the yarn. And when you comb the yarn, so which means that you improve by doing this, it's a length distribution, then you have a, a jump in strengths, which, which is logical. But even this, it's not enough. You don't except for uh, you know, the pretty bad cotton here. But for the good qualities, it's not enough. You jump a little bit, but you just don't jump enough to be at the level of the ring. If you look at yarn evenness, situation is quite different. So now yarn evenness, if it's higher, it's not good. Okay, You see that with the carded, all the data points are above the equality line. So it's, it's, it's not too good. But as soon as you come, now you are better than you think. Got it. So the length distribution has a very, very large impact on yarn evenness. You can look at the thin braces, and it's basically the same scenario. Combing improved drastically the number of thin places. You can look at the thick places. Same scenario. You can look at naps. Very, very, very large decrease in the number of naps with combing. Hairiness, which is already good. For, for the vortex, better than ring, and it's slightly improved uh, with combing, which means that length distribution has a very, very important uh, impact on the evenness of the yarns produced with vortex. Conclusion, cyber length distribution has a very large impact on vortex yarn evenness and a limited impact on vortex yarn tensile properties and airiness. Therefore, if you want to target the vortex market, breeder must improve length distribution. So now we know that we have to improve strengths and obviously elongation. And we have the tools to do that because now we can calibrate the AGIs for that. Second problem, length distribution, we are convinced that we can use the whole fibrogram to uh, provide enough information about fiber length distribution to be at least as good as the APHIS. We so all this, you know, it seems difficult to do. You know, I mean, I, I'm talking about going from 30 gram per tag to 50 uh, to, uh, to improve length distribution drastically, but it is possible. Our work 
very closely with a colleague at Texas A&M, Dr. Wayne Smith, since many, many years. And last year he sent, I told him, send me your best fiber quality lines, which he did. So here you have these 20 commercial bells, bells that I bought you know, just on the market. And obviously it was not random, it was the best bells I could find in upland cotton for tenacity. This is the line from Dr. Smith. You see that it's absolutely possible to improve pretty drastically the tenacity of vortex yarn with breeding. This is the uh, same thing, but for the number of thin places, you see that the improvement is, is drastic. So we, we have the ability of improving simultaneously tensile properties and fiber length distribution just with regular breeding. So to me at this stage, and we have not finished this work obviously, the most important fiber attributes for vortex are fiber length and length distribution, uh, mostly for young evenness, fiber diameter and fiber strengths uh, for young tensile property. So uh, I looked at all the bundle properties for fiber strengths. I, I want to look also at individual fibers. So we improve a lot HVI bundle elongation measurement, making possible uh, breeding for improved tensile properties. We demonstrated the importance of fiber length distribution for enhanced yarn quality. We demonstrated that the use of HVI fibrogram leads to better prediction of yarn quality. And we are currently working on implementing this improved measurement uh, in cotton breeding programs. A few references. Uh, my main sponsor for all this work is Cotton Incorporate. And if you have any questions. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Heke, for uh, a very interesting presentation. Uh, you have certainly set the gold standard for timekeeping, being just one minute over. Um, I'm very, very impressed by that. Um, I actually can't see the questions from my screen. Um, so, Dr. Cranthy, could you please um, read out some of the questions until I can try to rectify the situation? Yeah, thank you, Kai. I'm sorry about that, that you are unable to see the questions, but... Uh, um, there are some very interesting questions, uh, Dr. Saheke. Uh, this one is from uh, Manuel Pedro Malia. Uh, he's asking, uh, how is ginning outturn related to fiber maturity and fiber length? Ginning? Uh, like ginning outturn, the ginning percent. Ginning percentage? Uh, the, lint, the, the lint percent. Lint percent. Okay. Uh, so, you know, obviously, if you increase the quantity of lint, you decrease the quantity of seeds. That's, that's a given. So you don't want to go too far in improving the turnout. Because if the fibers, if the seeds are too small, then some may pass between the ribs of the gene which means that these seeds will go with a flow of lint, uh, will pass in the lint cleaner where they will be crushed. And then you will have a lot of seed coat fragments in your lint and all also because they are complete seeds. When you crush them, you know, you have the protein and the oil that will create some stickiness issues. In general, what I've seen, but I'm not claiming that it's representative because it's just what I've seen around, around here. You tend to have for longer cottons, slightly smaller seeds. Uh, but it's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that it's a strong trend. I've, I've seen this often, but uh, I'm not aware of a study that relates lean turnout to either maturity or length. Okay. Uh, 
This next question is from Dr. Vaiji Prasad, who is the director of the Central Institute for Cotton Research in India. He's asking, how can we integrate HVI into our breeding programs? I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the problem with, with uh, fiber testing is that you need to work in a conditioned environment. You need a lab at 65% relative humidity, plus or minus two, and uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And keeping these conditions is expensive. Then you have the machines themselves. HVIs are not cheap. You know, it costs, depending on the country, between three and $500,000 for one HVI. They need to be maintained extremely well. And they need to be run by technicians that know what they are doing, and especially that they run quality checks all the time to make sure that there is no drift or anything like that. Which means that for one team of breeder, it's very unlikely that they have the farms to have their own fiber lab. So here in the US, Basically, you have three main fiber labs. Our lab here at Texas Tech, which is probably the largest, one in New Orleans with USDA, and one in Raleigh with Cotton Incorporated. And I think that those three labs together test 100% of the cotton from breeders, the state breeders. Private companies, some of them have their own lab, but a lot of them use our facility too. So you have these centralized uh, testing facilities. I think, I think it is the way to go because you know, it's just too expensive for one breeding team to run a lab. Yeah, thank you, uh, This question is from Dr. Manikam from India. He's asking, what is the relationship between short fiber content and tenacity? You, you, you have clearly uh, one. So tenacity, if the tenacity is low, it means that your fibers are weak. When the fibers are weak, they tend to break uh, at the gene, uh, at the lean cleaner level, then uh, in the card, then at the drawing, so lower is the tenacity, higher will be the fiber breakage and therefore the short fiber. Um, thank you. Now this question is from Dr. Sabesh from India again. He's asking, what is the relationship between staple length and micronet? Are they directly related or is there no. a kind of inverse relationship? No, there is not really a, a, a strong relationship uh, be, between the two, uh, it's it's uh, you know Micronair, as I said, is related to both fiber diameter and maturity. Okay, it's a combination of these two measurements. Uh, you you can have you know Micronair of four, which is a perfect Micronair, and having a fiber that is one inch or a fiber that is 1.3 inch. Okay. You know, you, you, you've seen, for, for example, Pima cotton are much longer than upland cottons. Both can have the same micro. So there is not a direct relationship between the two. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, this question but is from- If I may, yeah, I'm sorry. there is something related to the different species of cotton. You know, the two main species cultivated it's Gossypium hirsutum and Gossypium barbadense. Gossypium barbadense, so it's a Pima cotton, it's Egyptian cotton. It's a much finer fiber. The fiber diameter is much smaller than for Gossypium hirsutum. Therefore, the micronairs, as it is a smaller diameter, tend to be lower for Pima than for upland. Okay. Um. Dr. T.P. Rajendran is asking this question. Do you recommend vortex spinning as a strategy to salvage low quality fiber with higher spinning efficiency? 
No, uh, not at all. Vortex is, is absolutely not good for low quality cotton. Vortex is for you know, uh, higher quality cotton. Currently, uh, you have some Vortex spinning, but it's always on Pima cotton because you know, it's very sensitive to lengths and especially to length distribution. So you cannot, if you, if you have poor quality cotton, the only thing you can do with it, it's open end. Okay. Um, this question is from Camilo, uh, now like from Latin America. Uh, the question is, which adjustment and fiber tests should be incorporated to have better market acceptability uh, when we are setting up an enterprise in Latin America? So, I mean, to, to, to have your data accepted internationally, I guess, that's the question, uh, you, you, you need to respect all the rules, uh, which means that you need to have equipment that is in excellent shape. You need to have your equipment uh, maintained by professional uh, on a very regular basis. You need to use standards that are internationally accepted. Uh, you need obviously to have a lab that is within the range of the accepted uh, tolerances for uh, temperature and humidity. You need all these things. If one is missing, you are not producing high quality data. Okay. Then, you know, I, I really think that pretty soon we will add some motions like, you know, elongation. A lot of people are interested in that, especially, especially at the breeding level right now. Uh, short fiber content, a lot of people are interested in, in that. So there, there is a trend to try to give information that is more relevant for the textile industry. Okay. But it's not easy to do. I mean, even when you have a method to measure something that is very relevant, then everybody needs to agree on it. I don't know. I mean, you, you are ICAC, so you have, you have been in a, many of these international meetings. You put 50 guys together in a room from, from different countries and ask them to agree on something new. Good luck. It, it, it doesn't happen in one day. It doesn't happen in one year. It's a very long process. It may take 10 years before a new fiber parameter can be accepted internationally. So this is the reason why I work with the breeders because the breeders, they don't care about international rules. You know, they try to make the best they can do. And the idea is that if you make a cotton that is superior, if the textile meals, when they buy this cotton, are very happy with what they get, they come back to you. Okay. Um, I think we'll be taking just only a couple of more questions, though there are questions coming in. This one is from Dr. Rajesh Patil from India. He's asking, what is the optimum fiber length to fiber strength ratio for the industry? For which type of spinning? Um, I'm not sure, but probably this could be the normal ring spinning. Normal ring spinning, uh, you know, it, 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 again, it depends on the end product. You know, if you want, if, if you want to make a carded yarn, you know, a kind of a, not mass market, but, but uh, not very high quality yarn, or if you want to make a comb yarn, if you want to make a dress shirt or if you want to make a khaki pant, that's not the same properties you are looking for. Okay. So to me, for ring spinning, the most important thing is a good length, obviously. Uh, you need to be, you know, a minimum 115 in inches uh, and there is no maximum. Low short fiber content, as low as you can. Okay. And, and a strength of around 30. Uh, but again, higher is better. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, there are actually two more questions. One is in uh, French. 
Uh, I'd like to uh, request the translators. Uh, this question is from Ba. So maybe the translator, the French translator could translate in English for Eric. Or maybe Eric, you could also... I, I, uh... I, I, I cannot <laughs> understand French, you know. <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> so maybe, okay. I mean, uh, because you can see the Q&A in your box. Uh, uh, you can take a look at Ba. But before that, there's this question from Dr. Mohamed Fariduddin. He's asking, is there any relationship between Micronair and fertilizer management? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's say that, especially nitrogen. Okay. Uh, let's say that you put too much nitrogen. So the plant has a lot of food and obviously you need some water too. If the plant is happy, the plant keep growing and growing and growing and growing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and making, you know, uh, uh, new branches, etc. And then at, one, at some point, it's the end of the season. You need to harvest your cotton. So you terminate your crop, but all these balls that were in development, they have not the time to reach maturity. And when, when you put an excess of nitrogen, you push basic, basically the vegetative uh, growth. And, and then the end of the season arrives and these, some of these balls don't have the time to mature and it's, harvested with everything else, it will decrease your micronair. Uh, it will increase your short fiber content because you have a lot of immature fibers that will break uh, and creates a, a, a bunch of problems. So fertilizers are good, but too much fertilizers, it's not good. Not only for fiber quality, but obviously for all the pollution issues also that go with that. So you have to be okay. cautious. Okay. Uh, now, this is the last question, which was in French. Now, the translation okay, is... Okay, so let me read it. It's... <laughs> okay. Where is this question in French? Yeah, but ah, in okay. English, yeah. So, he's asking, I, 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 I presume he's, it's a question on Vortex. Is He's asking, would, would we get the same uh, type of uh, results on, on synthetic fibers. And uh, if you want to blend uh, cotton and synthetic fibers, what, what, what do you need? How, how do you need to do that? So, um, obviously, you know, with synthetic fibers, it's currently the fibers of choice for Vortex for simple reason. You have the length you want. You know, you want 1.5 inch, you just cut at 1.5. You have the fiber diameter you want because you can engineer that. So you don't have variability in fiber properties. So it's much easier to deal with man made fibers than with a natural product. But you have a clear trend uh, with the consumers uh, to go toward natural fibers for, for, for a lot of reasons. But one of these reasons is pollution with microplastics that are absolutely everywhere in our environment. And I think um, will become one of the major health crises in, in the future. So, uh, basically, if you want to use man-made fibers, you will use the same criteria. You need fibers that are long, but you know it's easy to cut them the length you want. Obviously, they are uh, uniform because you manufacture them, uh, and you can manufacture the strengths also. If you want to blend with cotton, uh, then you have to make sure that the two types of fibers are, are compatible in terms of especially lengths. Uh, that's the main thing because after that, you know, I mean, man-made fibers, it's easy. You just manufacture whatever you want. Uh, that's the reason why it's not that interesting. Uh, natural products are viable by a sense. That's what makes the thing much more interesting. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Eric, uh, for the excellent presentation. And uh, uh, I, I now like hand over to Kai. Thank uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Eric. 
Um, there is um, one other question that's come in, but perhaps if you could um, just type the answer in, in the chat to that, Eric, and sure. we, can, we can carry on. Um, so my, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our second uh, speaker for today, which is, who is uh, Dr. Um, PJ, PG Patel. Um, uh, Dr. Patel is currently the Vice Chancellor of Mahatma Pool Agricultural University in Rahuri in India. He has professional experience of more than 28 years in research and research management in post-harvest processing of cotton value addition. He has previously worked as the director of ICAR Central Institute for Research on Cotton Technology and as a ginning consultant to the Ministry of Textiles in India. He has made a great contribution in the modernization of the Indian ginning industry, as well as skill development in the cotton sector. He has handled national and international developmental projects, including projects funded by the CFC, UNCTAD, uh, Cotton uh, Tap for Africa, uh, implemented in Eastern and Southern Africa. He has developed and commercialized novel technologies like nanotechnology, and he has also contributed to sustainable rural development through value addition, particularly of natural fibers and its biomass. Uh, today, Dr. Patil will be talking to us about wealth from waste, cotton byproducts, value addition. So welcome, Dr. Patil. The virtual floor is now yours. Uh, are you uh, hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my my presentation you can see. Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, uh, respected uh, Mr. Kai. Respected Dr. Kranti, uh, today's uh, speaker, Dr. Eric, and uh, fellow participants. Uh, it is my great pleasure that uh, I am amongst you to present the, my speech on the Wealth from West, Cotton Byproducts Value Addition, India's experiences in the most prestigious cotton webinars sponsored by ICAC and ICRA. Uh, as you know that uh, I just recently joined as the Vice Chancellor of one of the university, Agricultural University in Maharashtra, which is one of the state in India. Earlier, I was at uh, Sircot, Mumbai, Central Institute for Research on Cotton Technology, Mumbai. So, <clears throat> next. <laughs> Uh, you know that uh, cotton is grown in uh, more than 100 countries and traded in 150 countries. And this is just general information. Four species of cotton, Arborium, Thirsutum, Barbadens, Arbacium are grown all over the world. And almost 100 million farm families are engaged in cotton production. And around 350 million people are directly or indirectly involved in cotton and ancillary uh, businesses. In 2020-21, uh, uh, you know that world area is around uh, 31 plus million hectares and the production is around uh, 24 plus million tons and consumption is around uh, 24.5 million tons. And if you look at the India's uh, rank in the global scenario, we are the first in production by contribution of more than 26% of the total world cotton production. That is to the tune of around 6.3 million tons. Uh, this is again general information. I will not go into details, but uh, one thing important, these four countries, India, China, USA, Brazil, and Pakistan contribute around more than 75% of the world cotton production. And the main cotton consumers are China, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. 
and if you look at the global cotton trade it is up around uh, 9.4 million metric tons so if you look at the india uh, in this uh, global scenario uh, you will see that india is the largest uh, area under cotton cultivation is around uh, 13 million hectares and uh, and around uh, consumption is around 5.6 million tons we are exporting 1.2 million tons this is just information and in the graph you can see these are the states where cotton is grown more than around uh, 11 states now they are growing cotton uh, almost uh, north zone of india central zone of india as well as the south zone of india so if you now come to the uh, most important uh, topic that is uh, cotton is grown and we are getting the uh, after processing is a lint and the seed and the apart from that one very very valuable uh, byproduct which are often neglected that is the cotton stock is also we are uh, now utilizing in india so if you look at this uh, particularly uh, cotton value chain uh, from seed cotton first is the ginning then uh, spinning weaving garmenting almost uh, such up to garmenting almost uh, 20 unit operations are to be undergone to get to get the almost uh, final product including the chemical processing and the cotton is around uh, uh, two third of the two third of the uh, total uh, volume and we are getting the cotton linters hulls cotton seed oil cotton seed meal as the byproduct and from cotton stock stock we can make the very valuable products that is particle board briquettes pellets composting and it can be used as energy generation now So this uh, actually particularly slide gives the complete picture of the uh, uh, production of the wealth from the West, we can say. So uh, West part is a cotton stock at presently is being burned in uh, all the farms. And, but we can make the uh, briquettes, pellets, particle boards, we can grow the mushroom, we can convert into composting. It can be used in the cremations of the dead bodies as per the Hindu culture and it is uh, almost uh, hulls if you are getting it can be used as the bio enriched animal feed meal can be used for the making the pepton then the, it can be used as a protein rich doc for fish and poultry and the linter is a very very valuable product having the very high uh, chemical and physical properties which can be converted into nanocellulose regenerated fibers and other value products so this is uh, estimated availability of cotton seed, hulls and linters. Uh, these are actually cotton uh, main product, uh, uh, we can say is the lint. It is a common people's uh, mind that is a man is a lint, but the, there are cotton seed, hulls and linters are the byproducts. And this is, I will not go into details, this slide is uh, there so that you can see the huge potential uh, and availability is available of cotton seed, hulls and linters. So as for as my presentation is limited to India's experiences, so I, uh, as you know, the cotton seed production is around 12.5 million tons. And uh, cotton farmers are associated with this uh, cotton business, cotton farming is around 5 million. So now we will go directly to the value addition to the cotton seed cake. You know that around 12.5 uh, <clears throat> million tons of cotton seed is produced annually in India. It is available through the every year through the ginning factory after the ginning operation is completed. And the if you crush for the uh, uh, extraction of the oil, the you are, will be getting the cotton seed cake, and uh, it is almost 5.75 million tons of uh, cotton seed cake is available annually. So uh, this is oil cake uh, because the cotton seed. Uh, oil is extracted by two methods, but simple uh, screw expeller and one another method is the solvent extraction. So I have given the name oil cake means the cake obtained from the expeller, which is around 5.4 million tons. And from the uh, solvent extraction units, 
it is a little uh, less because less solvent extraction of plants are available in india which is around 3.5 million tons so this cotton seed cake is mostly used for the ruminant feeds uh, cows and buffaloes uh, for the uh, that is a milch animals and the but uh, limiting factor in this cotton seed cake is the availability or presence of the total gossypol content uh, in indian condition it is from the 0.6 percent to 1.15 percent in which around the uh, free gossypol is around maximum uh, 0.7 percent so gossypol is the limiting factor all of you know that the for the non-ruminant like fish and poultry uh, i will not go into much details about that but it is a limiting factor uh, because of having its disadvantage for the fish and poultry so in this and but in sirkot mumbai we have developed the small scale production of the decosypolized meal for the poultry and fish feeding uh, and uh, uh, sirkot has developed technology because why for fish and poultry uh, feeding because uh, uh, it is a little bit cheap source of protein as compared to the soybean protein and other other kind of alternative proteins so the cost of production for the poultry and fish is uh, we have we can reduce and the farmer will get or they will get more benefit out of that so this is the method of the decosypolization of the technology this is the microbial consortium of the uh, microbes uh, we have developed uh, and standardized the technology in sirkot mumbai uh, uh, and i am speaking on behalf of sirkot actually though i am not in sirkot right now but uh, i i am all the credit goes to the sirkot scientists so we have developed this method uh, right from the laboratory to the culture in flask then the some in the drums uh, and this uh, uh, then the, we can make in a tree fermentation and these microbes particularly uh, feed on the gossypol and uh, then we uh, mix in the our dry we have developed one uh, mixer as well as the dryer and we mix it and the uh, the output we are getting is the degossypolized cotton seed cake which can directly feed to the fish and poultry because the gossypol level will be reduced to the threshold level so these are the some of the photographs and this practical our experience experience shows that the reduction of free gossypol content is the tune of 80% then the bound gossypol we can reduce by our method is around 60% and in the process we are reducing the crude fiber up to 30% but improvement of protein content is the 40% and the by process also we are uh, very good uh, observation that the improvement in lysin content which is actually nutritional attribute for the animals so gossypol level our gossypol level meets the standards that is un's protein advisory group we have given the, they have given the standard and which is meeting the standards so enable uh, cotton seed meal for poultry and fish of course and uh, we are now trying to reduce the gossypol to 0% so that it can be used as the human protein supplement which can uh, actually in india that can be the uh, nutritional security for the rural population if we, we could succeed in that so the then uh, we this is actually i have given the uh, uh, cost uh, analysis for the small pilot scale production of the gossypol cake the and these are the actually uh, whatever uh, you can see the financial part is as per the indian conditions it will not be applicable to other countries but uh, what we have presented for the india so the cost capital cost investment is uh, around uh, 23000 us dollar and uh, operational expenses for this gossypolized cake production unit uh, is around uh, Uh, 11 uh, raw material cost is around 73000 us dollar and the operational cost including repair maintenance is 11000 so the gross annual income uh, is around 93000 and the net annual income is around 7385 so 27 us dollar per ton is the additional remuneration from this uh, unit so so if you then actually this is a new slide actually we have added and it is a recent development in our sirkot mumbai so our scientists have developed the uh, actually process or optimized the conditions for cotton seed protein isolate so the cotton seed so we are getting the defatted cotton seed meal 
and our experiments we have used the different uh, sample to solvent ratio and uh, this is the potassium hydroxide sodium sulfate uh, sodium chloride have been used uh, and uh, during the process protein recovery uh, uh, is there i will tell the protein what is the protein recovery but uh, uh, actually free gossip all we could find the below 0.045% it is a very good achievement and the ammonium sulfate the method we can uh, we got the protein about 90% uh, then the by use of ethanol we could get again about 90% and the isoelectric point uh, method the protein percentage is about 90% so then this is a new experimentation is going on in our institute and we are succeeding the making the seed uh, cotton seed protein isolate which can be used for the again uh, 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 as a protein supplement so these actually a uh, protein uh, which are getting can be used as uh, for edible purpose as well as the non edible applications so uh, edible means animal feed dairy products cookies food storage these are the some of the edible applications and the non edible is in that uh, that is pepton production and then the food packaging and the food food adhesive these are the non edible applications of uh, cotton seed protein so uh, the next slide gives the value addition and industrial applications of the linter linter is again one of the important by product and we can uh, add a tremendous value uh, to these linters so linter you know that it is a short fuzzy fiber of uh, cotton seed which is available on cotton seed after ginning it it can be extracted by the linting linters the machine called as a linter delinter then the potential available in india is around 0.69 million tons uh, and its uses it is very high applications uses that is a nanocellulose production which can be used in various applications uh, as well as the uh, cellulose nitrate in explosives then the cellulose acetate it can be used in uh, films and membranes then high grade paper which is currency grade paper security grade paper even we have uh, in developed the in our laboratory the currency grade paper out of this linters which is having uh, very good properties double fold properties moisture absorbent cob value these are the very good uh, particularly for this paper then uh, even we can use in a medical grade cotton which can be as used as absorbent cotton or surgical cotton then mcc that is micro crystalline cellulose which is being used in uh, filler in tablets we can make it from the linters and food cast casings and felts these are the very good applications uh, in of the linters and we can uh, add more value and uh, it if uh, it backward integration farmers should also be benefited from this so now again uh, this is a very important slide because uh, from uh, linters we have uh, developed the protocol uh, uh, which is uh, using the chemical method as well as the mechanical method to reduce the size of the cotton uh, fiber to the nano level which is 1 into 10 raised to minus 9 meter so during the process the uh, properties of the end product that is nan uh, is totally different from the original product that is original raw material that is linters so it has a very high mechanical strength almost an high young modulus a high surface area and that too it is uh, though it is a very good properties mechanical young modulus surface area that too it is a biodegradable that is uh, in the present era this is very important and it has a very novel optical properties so we have uh, uh, established our uh, uh, fifth pilot plant in the world at uh, mumbai uh, in a uh, institute so this is the method i will not go into details of this but this is the one of the application then the application of nanocellulose are in various fields it can be used in the filtration it can uh, filter the virus then it can be used in emulsion dispersion stabilizer in the pens it can be used in liquid crystal display then uh, it can be used as a non caloric food thickeners then the targeted drug delivery and then the fillers in cement the fillers in film paper coatings these are the some of the applications of the nano cellulose and we can even go for the uh, fertilizer uh, sector also 
then the uh, now i will go to the one of the again important uh, byproduct that is hulls uh, hulls is the process uh, actually material we will be getting uh, during the oil extraction process which is a scientific extraction when uh, cotton seed is after cleaning uh, then cleaning then it is dehulled and meat part will be separated from the hulls and the hulls can be converted into value added products so hull content if you see the chemical composition of the hull it is around uh, up to 47% alpha cellulose then the almost up to 27% pentazones then 20% lignin and 5% ash protein fats so it uses are the for extraction for industrial application you can use uh, we can make the purpural uh, and which is a industrial important chemical and uh, for the farming community side it is good roughage as well as commonly used in the feed lot and dairy rations but uh, in again we have developed some technology one technology which uh, have enhanced the utilization of hulls through bio enrichment so uh, using the again uh, microbial consortium with digestibility and the food protein content of the hulls can be enhanced by the fermentation process which increase the digestibility and enhance level of food protein can be can be used as a catalyst and it can be used as a catalyst uh, and uh, it can be used as a catalyst so again uh, this is a, a, a value addition and industrial application for short staple or comburn oil cotton again it is again a, a by product of the process so i will go i will tell in brief the value addition to short staple cotton which is availability is around 0.25 million tons annually uh, then the common uses are surgical cotton medicated cotton cotton ball ear buds security paper currency notes blends for coarse yarn and open end spinning for denim production so these are the some of the uh, photos also you can see then absorbent cotton technology so this actually a uh, short staple cotton or uh, can be uh, uh, converted into absorbent cotton or surgical cotton using uh, uh, small scale enzymatic process which can be uh, used at a village level uh, these photographs you can see from laboratory to the rural level uh, we have developed some uh, we have given the technology to uh, lady uh, groups in the villages Uh, and uh, some uh, uh, lady villages are now manufacturing the absorbent cotton, and uh, it is eco process, and uh, it is developed by the circuit. So, if you look at the uh, uh, absorbent cotton plant uh, in a little bit uh, 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 in a commercial mode, then these are the uh, uh, actually uh, sizes. I will not get into details. These are the processes: blow room, boiler, hydro extractor, wet. Uh, opener dryer carding rolling weighing cutting and uh, packing and can be sold in the markets so these are the standards for the absorbent cotton various uh, countries having the pharma copia standards india is having our own standard european is having own pharma copia standards and uh, this cotton is satisfying all the standards of the uh, so this is again uh, economics of the absorbent cotton i i will i have given this slide to the icsc they can even uh, circulate to our uh, all the participants or it can be in a public domain it can be put in so this is the uh, economics of the cost uh, cotton production so almost from this plant uh, net annual income it will be around uh, uh, 30000 dollar and payback period is around 27 months and the returns on investment is 37% it is very good So now next is what is it? Now cotton stock. Uh, cotton stock is uh, actually very bulky and uh, actually burned in the field itself. So tremendous potential. If worldwide you see almost sixty-seven million metric tons cotton stock available in the whole world. and i don't know how very and very little amount is being uh, used uh, for the value addition so if you look at the india's condition that uh, we are almost uh, 32.5 million tons of cotton stock is available in our india so almost uh, almost 
uh, uh, 10, 15 to 20 percent, 15 to 20 percent is actually available, uh, is used for the commercial exploitation. Other rest is actually burnt. Some part is being retained by the farmers for their own uh, fuel needs, and the rest of the cotton is burned in the fields. So, this is the photograph. These are the cotton stock, uh, cotton stocks after harvesting. This is a village level woman using cotton stock for cooking and the rest of the cotton stock is burned in the field. So uh, this is the uh, uh, actually uh, 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 and very limited uh, value addition at present. But CIRCOT efforts, actually we have developed the uh, technology and uh, we have given some of the technologies to the rural people also. And uh, this can be, uh, if you, uh, use these technologies, establishment of the cotton stock byproduct industries. It will create the entrepreneurship in uh, rural areas created. It will create employment opportunities in rural areas, will contribute in the doubling farmers income and so many things. So these are the applications of cotton stock. Uh, we can make the briquettes and uh, you know that its calorific value is around 4,000 kilocalorie per kg because cotton stock resembles the actually hardwood. So therefore, the calorie value is very high. So it can be converted into uh, bri briquettes, pellets, uh, or uh, we can make the uh, activated charcoal out of it. Uh, even we can grow the uh, mushroom on this and uh, even cotton stock, cheap cotton stock can be used in the power generation plants and it, some, and it is already being used in some of the parts of the country. And uh, then particle board making and making the furnitures and uh, there are so many things. So uh, this is the supply chain model developed by the CIRCOT. Uh, and uh, it is with logistics sales cost is around uh, 33 to 40 per US dollar per ton at factory gate. And the farmers will be getting the additional remuneration to the tune of almost 25 US dollar per ton. And uh, we have demonstrated to the farmers and stakeholders. And uh, in, in Maharashtra, with the help of the CIRCOT, almost 50 briquetting and plating plants have been established. So this is the, again, uh, photograph, uh, tractor mounted cotton chipper is there. In field itself, it is being chipped. And uh, with uh, blower, it directly it will feed to the truck lorry and lorry will take this chip cotton stock to the uh, particle board uh, manufacturing plant. And uh, this is the photograph of the Bhakti Biochar Energy Company in Katol. And uh, this is the almost uh, 5,000 acres. Uh, they are uh, contribute, they are collecting the cotton stock from the 5,000 acres and the number of farmers is around 1,000 from five villages. This is a successful model and they are earning also. So these are the some of our farmers have been celebrated and the total income of the five villages, only this cotton stock activity is around 67,000 US dollars. So, uh, and uh, if you look at this uh, additional income to the farmer is around $33 per hectare of the cotton cultivated. So, now we will go to the uh, industrial applications of the briquettes. So it is very interesting that uh, I think uh, on the UNCTAD uh, actually program, we have uh, technical collaborators with the UNCTAD project. And uh, this is the photo, uh, these cotton uh, pellets, briquettes have been made with, from such kind of uh, machines. And it is used in the industrial boilers and uh, some of the boilers now using the cotton stock briquettes instead of the using the coal. And now they are replaced coal with the briquettes made from the cotton stock as well as the other agro -resin. So um, now will this is the again uh, commercial utilization, uh, some uh, uh, cost benefit ratio and other investment about the uh, 69,000 US dollar and uh, net annual income is around 36 US dollar uh, uh, from this particularly 20 ton per day capacity plant. So again, this, some of the farmers have been benefited by our ministers 
and uh, this is some of the uh, summary uh, almost uh, uh, briquetting plant that is bhakti biocol they are having capacity 20 ton per day and their income is around us dollar 8 per ton production is around 6000 tons per year. income per plant is around 48000 us dollar so applications of briquettes in cremation this is actually innovative application of the cotton stock briquettes because you know in hindi uh, in hindu culture dead bodies have been uh, cremated with uh, fire and uh, but uh, at uh, present uh, wood is being used but uh, we have our intervention uh, we have developed some uh, uh, frame structure uh, which gives the some forced hair and uh, with this structure this you can see these figures the some one half hp motor is being given so continuously controlled oxygen supply will be given through the pipes and uh, uh, and because of that we can use cotton briquettes for the cremation this is the actual photograph of the cremation and our this cremation is been established at nagpur crematorium so if you see this chart, you can see uh, the traditional cremations with the help of wood uh, is almost uh, requirement of the wood is around 300 kg per cremation. But circuit technology, if you see only 200 kg briquettes are required, saving of 100 kg. Then kerosene, uh, 5 liters is required because the wood is not taking fire so easily. So you need a kerosene. In our case, no kerosene is used, not required. Camper one kg, here one half kg, ghee two kg, one kg. So almost a total cost per cremation is $73 US dollar. But in if you use the ICER circuit crematorium using briquettes made from cotton stock, only 33 US dollar. So we can sell 40 US dollar per cremation, almost 55% of the same. And Pores can be now uh, actually uh, will are uh, actually uh, uh, getting uh, benefit out. So now next slide is around uh, uh, cotton stock. One minute. Uh, uh, okay. So cotton stock per agro biomass one ton per acre. Annual cotton stock agro bias requirement is one million for one million cremations. If you assume only. So uh, 0.2 million tons uh, will be uh, required and uh, additional income to the farmers is the tune of almost 2.7 million per annum. So now again, another uh, application is the briquette pelleting. When the diameter of the uh, uh, diameter of the pellet is around six millimeter or nine millimeter, uh, then the, we can call as a pellets. These are the small one and it can be used for the uh, cooking purposes in hotels as well as the in the roadside uh, hotels so this is the uh, again uh, uh, economics of the commercial utilization of utilization of the pelleting plant so almost uh, net income annual income would be around 8300 uh, for the three ton per day capacity plant. So my next slide is around, uh, this is the case study again, uh, one that is the Manjul Liado, which is a village, there is one village in uh, Nagpur district of Maharashtra. Uh, the capacity of the plant is two ton per day and he is uh, making 600 tons per year and uh, he is uh, uh, actually annual income is around 5,675 US dollar and the return on investment is 33 around 30% so it is a good intervention so then uh, because our cotton stock pellets are having uh, more percent of ash as compared to the pellets premium pellets available in the market which is having a loss less than 1% and the existing pellet stores are not uh, suitable for the pellets manufactured from cotton stock having a higher ash percent therefore circot has Develop one continuous feeding pellet stove. You can see in this uh, slide, and uh, this is actually application in one of the hotels, roadside hotel. 
so uh, we have developed our own and it is having a very good uh, market and almost uh, if you look at this uh, uh, pellet substitute for lpg gas at present some of so many uh, users are using lpg gas and it is a substitute uh, and cost saving is 50 percent uh, one thing once we should remember and it is actually cotton stock is a renewable source of uh, Every year we are going, we are growing cotton. Every year this cotton stock will be available. So LPG one day it will finish, but our, this is a renewable source of the energy and it is assumes a very importance. And at present also in near future, it will be very, very important from, uh, as a green energy. So now uh, apart from getting the more remuneration to the farmers also. So if you look the plate production, uh, if you look from almost from 12, 2012, the actually uh, requirement of the uh, production of the uh, these pellets is increasing. Almost worldwide in 2018, almost 55 million tons of the uh, pellets have been uh, uh, actually produced in various countries, Europe, uh, then North America, South America, China, other Asia, Oceania. So uh, then if you look the this slide is very interesting slide if you look at the alternative to wood pellets because wood pellets means we have to cut the jungles then the forests so china is producing around 20 million metric tons to the uh, and cotton stock availability in china is 9 million metric tons so if you replace uh, with this uh, cotton stock almost 47 percent of uh, wood uh, it will be replaced and there is a very uh, almost 50 percent jungle and wood have been saved in north america if you look the they are producing wood pellets 11 million metric tons but cotton stock i will it is 10 million metric tons almost 91 percent there is a chance to replace the wood with the cotton stock in asia it is tremendous because only wood product pellet production is 3.9 million million metric tons but if you look the cotton stock availability around 40 million metric tons so 100 percent we can replace uh, and this is the so this is the interesting slide uh, for the benefit of the participants so now we can also make the particle boards and uh, this is the plant established under common funds for commodities funds received from them we have established and uh, it is running and this is the cabin decorated or panel with the boards made from cotton stock. So these are the another products, other products. We can make the uh, cotton stock or epoxy composites uh, having a better mechanical and good thermal resistance properties, as well as it can be uh, thermal resistance roofing panels in the construction field and automotive sectors. It can be used in the agriculture sector, in nursery, we can make these small pots. Using this pot, you can see it is made from the cotton stock and with some epoxy resin has been added. So these are the another innovative application of the cotton stock. Then uh, even uh, activated charcoal can be used in the mask, which can filter the viruses and face masks. So on-farm application of cotton stock, on-farm farmer, uh, that is just, it is on farm application means the bio enriched compost making from cotton stock. So uh, this is the, and if you look at the uh, composition of NPK, uh, it is around a good almost 1.43%, uh, 0.78% uh, P and 0.82% K and it is uh, uh, better than the farm yard manual. And the farmers are also now started the making the uh, compost from the cotton stock and additional income to the farmer is around US dollar 46 per ton. So this is the one on farm application and very easy application, a simple application. So again, uh, the cultivation of the or production of the oyster mushroom for, on cotton stocks. So yield of the mushroom on cotton stock is around 300 gram per kg of cotton stock and duration is 30 days to harvest per crop. And if you look at the additional income to the farmer is around US dollar 80 per acre. So, uh, and, uh, if, and if you convert into per hectare, it is around 200 US dollar. Uh, and uh, some of the, uh, I, I will give the practical exam, uh, example 
for this that is this is small uh, gentleman he is a farmer he is having a cotton field and he is uh, now producing the uh, mushroom using uh, cotton stock as a substrate and he is generating income to the tune of 800 us dollar per year apart from doing the agriculture or apart for doing the cultivation of the cotton so this is the uh, small uh, intervention by the farmer so now next slide is around for uh, uh, initiatives of untad wto itc to promote by product based value chain and with this our experiences and there are so there are various successful models uh, then untad has initiated project and implemented project for the eastern and southern africa and uh, we were the actually uh, some of the we are the, we were the technical uh, technical or technology providers and our scientists have visited to various countries tanzania uganda zambia zimbabwe many times myself dr kanti used to meet in some of the such kind of meetings uh, we meet in tanzania we meet in uganda so this is very good with our experience some we are very happy that some sipor countries or african countries are taking benefit out of this at least uh, uh, it will take some time of course but uh, they are got awareness uh, what is actually uh, how uh, very how uh, what is the strength of the cotton stock or what is the strength of the cotton biomass or other by products uh, for the cotton and it will certainly uh, catch in future so my bottom line it is my last slide that is the sustainable development in cotton sector can be achieved through adoption of the viable technologies of value addition to cotton by products to create wealth from west uh, generation of the renewable energy uh, examples are briquettes pellets and uh, this can be converted and this can be used in power generation then the promotion of technology based industrial applications of cotton by products on farm entrepreneurship development then promoting and exploring use of cotton seed cake for poultry and poultry and fish feeding exploring option of absorbent cotton production uh, employment generation at rural level uh, with the development of value chains and uh, developing the entrepreneur capability through capacity building programs so with this uh, there is a lot of uh, though cotton is grown for the fiber but there are other by products which cannot be neglected in future it has a tremendous potential for the industrial applications as well as the additional providing additional remuneration to the farming community so i think uh, this is my thank you very much for patience hearing thank you yeah, thank you very much dr patel as always very informative and very very useful um kai if you uh, since you say you still can't see the questions uh, i'll i'll uh, go through them uh, this question is from dr sabesh from india uh, he says uh, like cotton seed oil is not a traditional oil in india and uh, it is not really uh, it's it is not a traditional edible oil in india so he is asking uh, though it is mixed in oils is that legal and uh, what kind of steps can be taken to make it legal uh yes uh, you know is the traditional oil even if you go to gujarat they are using the as a traditional oil because if you go to kerala you will get the coconut oil which is not tradition in maharashtra or north india so uh, some part of uh, country it is a uh, traditional Uh, i think uh, uh, i think some uh, cotton seed oil is mixed i think as per the uh, act also i think it is now uh, allowed to mix the oil uh, with the other oil and blend it and they can uh, sold it All right thank you so i think problem i think sabesh i think uh, we will talk afterwards on this issue <laughs> because you are in india and uh, we, we will always be happy uh to talk to you okay sure okay uh, yeah. like this question is from mr rajiv barwa actually he is having two questions but the first Arima. one i Arima thought uh, means again, uh, <laughs> it's very quick 
little i think question maybe okay. i think like, i think uh, dr kranti uh, i think the circuit scientists uh, i think are in they have joined this uh, program yes there are there are several oh, of them so, yeah so uh, on my behalf also they can give the answers because i am on their behalf i am presenting here Well, I think I think this one you must answer anyway. <laughs> like Rajiv is asking, uh, one it is in terms of the importance of incorporating stocks back into the soil to increase soil fertility. Uh, apart from uh, a good control measure for the pink bollworm. Uh, now, what do you think that uh, uh, with reference to incorporation of the stocks into the soil and uh, or using the uh, stocks? Uh, for any of these byproduct value addition to make briquettes pellets or particle boards what do you think is a better idea uh, uh, actually uh, rajiv actually it is a, a very good question it uh, depends because if some farmer wanted to uh, they do not have a such uh, uh, financial strength they can go for briquetting and pellet plant they can easily uh, compost it and they can uh, use that this is a very easy method it is a uh, very uh, and of course uh, uh, they, uh, more, but it is a little less value addition if you go for the composting but if you go for uh, briquetting pelleting briquetting is a little more value addition pelleting still more more than the uh, briquetting pellets are costlier than the briquettes then if you go to the particle board again it is a cost so this is the uh, level of the uh, uh, value addition and it depends upon the capacity of the person of the uh, how much amount he can invest in that particular uh, business uh, like his other question is why is the linter production in india so low uh, hmm. is there an idea what is the volume from india of linters it is it is uh, answer to this question is very simple Uh, because economical uh, 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 extraction of the linters from cotton seed is not economical viable at present because too much energy is required and quantity and though second one important thing is our indian cotton is gene on roller gene so less linters are available at uh, at uh, uh, on the seed after ginning so extraction percentage of the linter is again very less secondly uh, there are say, very uh, uh, big and huge machinery is required for extraction of the linters so the, uh, uh, the cost involvement in the erection and commissioning of such plants is huge and it is not economically viable secondly uh, the question is how much quantity available in the, around 20000 uh, 20000 tons uh, is available in this industry. do potential is too much because you know only 5% or 10% of the cotton seed is being extracted scientifically and the uh, and the during process only 5 to 10% of the cotton seed available for the linting purpose so only 20000 around 20000 tons of linter is available uh, not much yes, <clears throat> uh, like professor jodi shafla is asking how do farmers in india handle the stocks after picking before they take the cotton stalks for further processing that i think in my presentation i told uh, 5 to 10% stock they keep for their uh, energy purpose to satisfy their energy purpose in for cooking the food and uh, almost uh, almost 10 to 15% is uh, converted into briquettes pellets and some value added products and rest is uh, burned in the field okay um Now, Dr. Mamad Akhtar Zaman from Bangladesh is asking this question: Is there any medicinal value of cotton plant root extracts? So I do not have an answer to this because it is a very good actually uh, question. We can now start the research on that whether really it has <laughs> some medicinal value. It is a researchable uh, actually issue we got. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, representative from Bangladesh. Okay, uh, we will start some research on this. Dr. Mohammad Fariduddin is asking: uh, Is cotton seed cake harmful for ruminant cows? No, no, no. Okay. Now, uh, uh, Professor Jodi Shafla is asking this question. She is from United States. She is asking: How difficult would it be to add a computer program to the HVI that will give you 
the fibrogram output. Now, this question probably it is to the two of you. Uh, if uh, I mean, if you can answer, it would save us time, or we'd go to Professor Eric. I think yeah, I can Eric... answer if you want. Excellent, excellent, yeah. Professor Eric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, we are working on that. Okay. We are we are working on that. Uh, we hope to have, to be able to extract the fibrogram straight from the HVIs uh, uh, automatically within a few months. Okay. Uh, like Professor Murtaza, Dr. Murtaza is asking uh, a little bit more explanation on degossipalization. In uh, I mean, in uh, like in view of our time, like probably you can keep it brief. But he's asking what exactly is the process for degossipalization? Uh, it cannot be disclosed here. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, because it is a consortium of uh, micro microorganisms. So I think uh, let him uh, correspond with us directly. Our email ID has been given. Right. Okay. Uh, Dr. T.P. Rajendran is asking a question. So, uh, uh, like I'll be reading his question, the diabolism in uh, pig bulbar management in India by destroying fruiting bodies after harvest in cotton fields in the current past scenario is overwhelming. While planning for stock processing without decontaminating the stocks from various pests, including pig bulbar. Dr. Patil may please comment. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Keshokranti can comment on this also. <laughs> <laughs> you are the right, right authority. I wouldn't hazard a risk. Professor Rajendra himself is a great authority on that. So we we'll yes. leave it at it. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's this question from uh, Professor Setin uh, Karadame. Uh, he's asking the average yield of 487 kilograms per hectare is very low. What could be the reason for these low yields? In India? In India. I, again, Dr. Kranti, you're the authority. Um, okay, I, 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 I am a, I am an engineer. I am a post harvest engineer. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm just taking the liberty to answer this. Yeah, uh, answer, like Professor Setin, uh, uh, plant population in India is uh, probably the lowest in the world. It is uh, it's, it's almost at about uh, eleven thousand to eighteen thousand plants per hectare, which takes a long period of time, and the management window becomes difficult. I mean, this in our analysis at the ICAC. Uh, what we see is uh, the planting geometry is a major problem which creates this. So, I mean, uh, that, but there is a lot uh, to be discussed on it. Okay. Uh, Dr. Venkatesh from Raichur is asking this question. He says uh, more than 90% of Indian cotton is Bt cotton. Now, that also means uh, that Bt is in our food chain. So, uh, any comments, please? Again, you are, you are asking me. <laughs> okay. BT is certainly in our food chain in oil, but then uh, uh, like studies that were conducted by the Indian Institute, I mean, by the Central Institute for Cotton Research, we did a three-year study. And what we found was that refined oil uh, doesn't actually contain any of the BT protein. It's only in the crude uh, oil, you can still find some remnants of it. Nevertheless, even in terms of the safety, uh, BT proteins weren't really found. Uh, I mean, even in the crude oil, if consumed at those low levels, uh, there has been no relationship with uh, anything that can be related to health concerns. So yes, though it is in the food chain, it's uh, it, it wasn't uh, seen to be a major concern. I think uh, this was it, but then there's one question from Sabesh, which I would like to take. Uh, he is a bit skeptical about uh, the market value of uh, cotton stocks and other byproducts for the farmer, as well as whether how feasible it could be in terms of a future market proposition. Uh, yes, actually, uh, again, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Kranti, you are also aware how difficult uh, our farmers have to convince, how difficult village people have to convince and uh, slowly, slowly, we are started uh, uh, doing the, such kind of activities, uh, uh, actually educating the farmers not to burn. And now slowly, slowly uh, at Nagpur area, we have started. And uh, uh, 
though uh, it is at present uh, not much remunerative, but at least uh, some remuneration they are getting. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, when uh, this is a renewable source and uh, you know that even particle board also, uh, particularly earlier days, uh, cotton, uh, even wood chips have been used making the particle boards. But uh, the, there is a ban on the this uh, sector, then the people are using the bagas. Otherwise, bagas is not, nobody was using. So same case now, bagas is uh, actually now being used as the co-generation. Now, at almost after three, four years, the bagas also will not be available for making particle boards. So now I could see there is no any uh, raw material available in this country uh, uh, for making the particle board. So I think slowly the, it will this sector will pick up and uh, it will pick up for this uh, raw material. Thank you, Dr. Patel. There are just two more questions. I think we'll quickly take them. Now, these were in the chat box, but I'm, uh, uh, I'll, uh, like I'm taking them up. Uh, this question is from Dr. Srikant Patil. He's asking, what is the impact of naked seed types on lint yield and fiber properties? I, uh, if, if Professor Herrick uh, can uh, take this up. The impact of naked yeah, seed sure. on lint yield and fiber properties. I mean, on lint yield, I don't think it has any any type of, of, of impact. Uh, so in general, uh, naked seed, uh, it's much easier to gene. So you exert less forces on the fibers when you gene, which means that you use less energy at the gene. You have uh, less broken seeds, which mean less seed code fragments. And as you exert less forces on the fibers, you have less breakage, which means you have a better length distribution. So all this is pretty positive. Okay. Yeah, but thanks for that. Yeah, I'm sorry. I've seen myself. So <laughs> the attachment force on some of this naked seed is extremely low. The, the, the force that attach the fibers to the seed so low in some cases that you don't even need a gene to gen it. Basically, the lint fall from the seed. You don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Professor Eric. Now, this is the last question uh, from Dr. Abraham Biru. Uh, he's asking, is there any relationship of species and genus with gossypol content in minimizing cost of removing gossypol as well as its implications in oil quality. So the first question is, is there any relationship with gossypol content and the four species of cotton? Actually, uh, I have, we have not studied. Uh, Professor Eric, anything, uh, any update on that? No, I mean, I don't really have data on that. I, I, I think it may have a little bit more gossypol in, in uh, Gossypium uh, babadense. Uh, but for the other two, I, I just don't know. Uh, anybody from Sircot can answer? Um, anybody on the line? In the line? I think, uh, okay, anyway. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, there were studies that were conducted at uh, CICR at the Central Institute for Cotton Research in Nagpur. Uh, and indeed, uh, there were differences and uh, um, like some of uh, the native uh, Gossypium arboreum uh, types, they did have more of Gossypol compared uh, to the recent Elite uh, uh, varieties of Hirsutum. Uh, I, I can't recollect offhand, uh, like what was the difference uh, between Barbadens and Hirsutum, but it is true that both like Herbaceum as well as Arboreum, they had more of Gossypol compared uh, uh, to Gossypium Hirsutum. But any of my other colleagues can add, uh, those who are from uh, CICR, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be more than happy. They can type in the chat or maybe in the Q&A box uh, if, if they have any better information. Right, I think uh, there's, uh, there's just one last question, uh, which is uh, from Dr. Isabel Agarwal. So I'm taking it before we close down and uh, go to uh, uh, the second, uh, Kai Hughes, does the stock quality change with different hybrids and varieties? Does the cotton 
stock quality? Is it dependent on varieties or hybrids? It depends upon varieties and hybrids also. It depends upon the con on condition on which it is grown, whether it is rain fed or whether it is irrigated, that it, it varies. Okay. Uh, okay, there's one more last, which is I don't want to miss this out. Dr. Murtaza is asking, can cotton plant be used as a vegetable if it is degossipalized? <laughs> it's an interesting question. So it's... I'm not sure, Dr. Murtaza, if uh, any one of us uh, know the answer for this because it is hypothetical, but it's very, very interesting. Thanks for asking this. Uh, Kai, will you be able Thank to... Thank you very much indeed. Unfortunately, we have definitely run out of time now. Um, so I'm going to close the session by, first of all, thanking our two presenters, Dr. P.G. Patil and Dr. Eric Heke, uh, for two very interesting presentations. My second thanks must go to all of you who attended today, um, and uh, especially those who've asked questions, because that adds to the interest as well. And my third thanks goes to the interpreters who work dil diligently behind the, the scenes. So um, the next um, um, uh, webinar is on the 2nd of June, where we will be having presentations from uh, Professor Jody Scheffler and also um, a joint presentation by Dr. Bruno Bachelier and uh, Jean-Paul Goula. So, um, so we're getting two for the price of one there. So that's, um, that's great, something to look forward to. Book it in now in your diaries and we look forward to seeing you in, on the 2nd of June. And until then, keep safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. And thank you, Dr. Patil. Thank you, Dr. Eric, once again for the brilliant presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you.